from uh, Swati and all of you uh, for this talk. Uh, I would uh, like to request our Dean, uh, Dr. Elika uh, Asumi, to uh, say a few words about uh, uh, our department and also about today's event. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Gaurav, for the lovely introduction, for such an interesting speaker. We are indeed very fortunate, uh, Dr. Moitra, to have you with, uh, speak to us on such a remarkable um, topic. Um, now, in our local context, unlike, say, Assam or Manipur, theatre, unfortunately, is a lost art. And having lectures such as these will help us revisit our oral traditions as well as uh, perhaps inspire us, especially the students in this direction. Um, and yes, we are, as far as our department is concerned, this is the first uh, PG studies webinar that we are, um, well, we've had students, uh, students webinar, but this is um, it, when we have an external speaker, this is the first time that we are organizing this. Uh, so thanks to Gaurav as well of putting us in touch with you. Um, we hope that we will continue this relationship uh, even in the days to come. Um, additionally, we're, you know, I think this is an exciting direction that we are taking for our department. Uh, our first batch of MS students will be uh, graduating um, next year. Um, so, you know, with these few words, uh, and in the interest of giving you as much time as possible, uh, I humbly request uh, you to begin your lecture. You. Right. Hi, good morning. Hello, everybody. Uh, first and foremost, I'm so grateful to Tetsu College, everybody here for giving me this opportunity to meet you and to talk to you. Uh, thankful also to Gorab for you know introducing me to this young and exciting batch of students whom I would not have interacted with otherwise. Um, I, I'm just glad you're all here and I hope not to bore you too much, but hopefully the first question that we've been asking all throughout 2020, can you hear me? Am I audible? Um, so if you have any uh, problems regarding the audio, just let me know in the chat box or something, right? Uh, because this can be a little dicey at times. But without wasting a lot of time, uh, I'm going to start talking about, I mean, our, our topic today, I've named it King Oedipus and I. So we'll be talking a little bit about this particular play, which happens to be one of the best known, most performed plays out of classical Greece. And again, I'll, I'll explain the social context to you a little bit. In fact, that's how I'll begin. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to lay this out to, for you. Um, my lecture today, of course, is titled King Oedipus and I, Revisiting Classical Greek Theatre in the Age of COVID-19. And in this lecture, I'm going to talk about Oedipus Rex and how we might read such a text in this time of the pandemic, which has been new and un unprecedented in any of our lives. And the exigencies of our pandemic times, in my opinion, it sort of demands that we take a look at a text like this. And so therefore, in this lecture, I hope to speak of some aspects of Oedipus Rex, rereading this, what is it, is a timeless classic, in a way that I think will resonate with all of us. But I think before I even go on to do on my, I mean, my analysis, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have a brief introductory discussion, say about 10 minutes, on what the Greek theater culture was like. Uh, this will help us because some of you may not be familiar with, I mean, all of us know what theater is and all of us know what goes on there. But as you must understand that, Traditions of theatre, traditions of performance necessarily vary from one place to another. The oral traditions of your state, which uh, your dean was just talking about, are distinctly different, say, from the neighbouring state five minutes later. In fact, uh, northeastern India is probably one of the most, if not the most diverse region of India, where performance traditions can shift and change within a distance of uh, you know, a few miles. That's how diverse the region is. So 
as performance traditions and cultures are diverse, even in your part of the country, so we have to understand that we are talking about performance traditions in a country and in a society that is very far removed from us, both in terms of geography, because it's in Greece, which is, of course, in Europe, and it's also removed from us in time because we're talking about a period that's almost 2000 years ago right so that's something i want you to have a concrete grasp of and so i'll take 10 minutes of your time to talk a little bit about greek theater and about the story of oedipus rex if you may not be familiar with it for anyone here who's already versed in it i apologize for uh, you know repeating that but i think it will help all of us uh, so in order to do that what i'm going to do is i'll start presenting um and i think i have to go to uh, one particular window um just give me a minute please a tab right Right, so uh, is the tab uh, visible to you right now? Um, can can somebody please clarify that this is visible, Gorab? Um, yes, yes, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's visible. visible. Okay, yeah. so I'll I'll start with the I'll right. Uh, so again, this has shockingly come at at the end. Stop. Right. Uh, so again, as the title page itself suggests, that we are going to talk about contemporary things. Swati, not just... uh, quick, uh, Swati the, the slide is uh, not there. Like the I, can't is... see the, I can't see it on the screen. OK, somehow I think the present, oh, actually, the presentation mode has somehow gone off. Thank you for pointing that out. Let me go back there again. Um, is it visible now? Yes. Yes, yes. How about now? Yes, now it is uh, visible. Okay, yes. so I'll keep it in this mode. Hopefully, it will not create too many issues. Right. So, right, as the uh, header image itself suggests, uh, I think to you that uh, we'll be talking about a lot of contemporary things as well. So, but in order to understand why we are talking about a play that is basically 2000 years old, uh, you need to have a little bit of an understanding of who we are talking about in the first place, right? So uh, we'll come a little bit, we'll, we'll, in this first 10 minutes, we'll have a brief discussion of what I call uh, performance culture in Greece, okay? the performance traditions, because um, now it is established in contemporary scholarship. And this is something that you will also get a glimpse of should you ever have the opportunity to study Aristotle's poetics, that in Greece, theater was not only very significant as a part of their culture, it was also, and we're talking especially of ancient Athens here, but also other parts of Greece had their own uh, theater traditions. Uh, it emerged out of ritual, that is to say, out of worship. What would happen is that, uh, again, Greece had a pluralistic uh, religious structure, so they had multiple gods and goddesses. And what would happen is that, uh, during prayer, during worship, during ritual, songs were sung in front of the god or the goddess in order to please them. And out of those songs and dances, which were initially performed only for the gods, emerged a form that is the Greek theater. So then they added dialogue to it, they added actors to it, and it became a full-fledged performance tradition. Now, parts of this we will never really know in detail about because we don't have enough information on it. But we know that by the time, say, we come to the 4th century BC or the uh, 5th century BC, Greece already has a very thriving culture of theater. Um, if you look at this vase in the image, this is from the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. You can see that there you have women and young men who are sort of preparing for a very special occasion. And so various occasions like wedding rites, like funeral rites, and of course, religious rituals would involve these kind of performances. And this old vase is actually helping us understand that a little bit. It's from the fourth century, right? 
And this image, if you can see the uh, screen in front of you right now, this is a surviving ancient theater in a place called Epidaurus. Now, this is a very remarkable ruin because it's one of the few ruins that has not only survived, it's actually survived in such a good condition that nowadays it's still used for staging performances of old plays, mostly for tourists. But it's I mean, a lifetime dream of mine to visit this place one day. But Take a look at the theater. So what's it like? You can see that there is a circular performance space right at the middle where the actors would, of course, gather and perform. And from there onwards, you can see that the gallery is sort of going upwards. Uh, they had a very fine technology. And if I had time, I'd show you a video as to how people can hear. They don't have mics, right? But the sound technology of the stadium is such that you can sit at the back and you can still be uh, still be hearing the people who are at the front. So that's how it's made the limestone sort of echoes. Uh, we don't need to worry about that. But I want you to again understand that this is what a Greek theater looked like. And so you could easily, it's almost like a modern day stadium. And you could easily have around 10,000 people watching a play on the days of a big festival. So this was not only a uh, this was not only an event that people liked, but you can see that it was meant to accommodate as many people as possible. It was performed on festival days, on which everybody, even slaves, were released on that particular day, so that they had the license to come to the theater. So that's how important, socially important, it is. You see, it's a space for community gathering. It's a space where people come together and they talk about, uh, you know, they watch something that's important, not just to them personally, but to them as a community. The plays that were performed in this theater, they were in fact publicly funded. So it was not like I am fund funding my own play. No, one rich person of the city would be given the responsibility that you fund this group, you fund that, that group so that everything could be ready for the theater festival. So again, you have people actually coming together even before the festival in order to make sure that the performance tradition stays alive. Because you see, it's not just about a person or their art. It's about a community and their art. It's about the public. So that's something about Greek theater that you really need to understand because that aspect of this as a public form of art will come up in our discussion. This is a this this was probably the most important theater space in ancient Greece. This is called the theater of Dionysius. Dionysius is the god of wine and also the arts. Um, this is where the huge Dionysia festival would happen. And he, as you can see, this is very badly broken. It's very old. It has not survived historically. But this is in present day Athens. And again, it's, it's one of the uh, must visit sites if you go to, ever go to Greece. This was probably as beautiful and as big, if not bigger than the, state, than the other theater that we saw. And this is the Acropolis. This is the Temple of Athena. The, the Acropolis actually overlooks, this is on top of the hill, that's at the bottom of the hill. So this actually overlooks that theater space. So again, you can, I think you can imagine the sort of gathering that would happen. On festival days, the temple would be lit up. It would be, of course, on top of the hill. And at the bottom, you would have thousands of people gathering in order to watch the play. Right. So again, it's a social, it's a community, it's a public event where people come to celebrate. Uh, and here I will play for you. And uh, so that's one aspect of Greek theater. The second aspect of Greek theater that you absolutely must understand before I go on to talk about Oedipus is that Greek theater had one component, which was called the chorus. So now when we think of theater in the present day context, we think of, you know, actors talking, having dialogue. Maybe there are actors who also, uh, apart from talking and having conversations, they might sing or dance if it's a musical. But on the Greek stage, you had at, uh, close to 30 actors. Not, uh, 20, you had around 20 six to 28 actors, depending on the number of speaking parts. Out of these, 24 of the actors were actually singers and dancers. This group was called the chorus. The chorus 
what they used to do was they mostly sang and again remember i told you the story that greek theater came out of ritual and singing so that component of singing and dancing remained very important to them even later and in fact this is something that we really miss out on you know when we uh, study this theater in class we miss out on this element of song and dance and how exciting it would have been for the audience but uh, the greek chorus now this is important c h o r c h o r u s the chorus had 24 actors their job was to sing and dance they would interact with the other actors who had speaking roles who would you know you could not have more than 2 to 4 actors depending on the circumstances so most actors played more than one role but the chorus as this block of 24 people they sang danced they talked and interacted with the characters but they never themselves participated in the action of the play the events of the play so that was a very distinctive feature of the chorus now i of course cannot really take you back to the greek chorus but i will show you one small example of a modern play where they use the chorus this is also a greek play called medea um just look look at what the chorus is doing it's, a, it's there'll be four people here the chanting here this chanting is being done by the chorus now love's betrayed corrupted turned to hate says to these four people that's the chorus so medea poor medea is cast aside wife i bore your children had i not you might have had an excuse at least you broke why double and more do you want the servants to throw you out please grow you're making a scene just one thing please just go one more day you see them singing on their own telling him how the right he is i now realize his royal marriage is a good thing well even if it does mean betraying me i'll send them the gifts private gifts to ask for an amnesty this is also the chorus You can see they're also doubling up as actors here. Because I'll saturate my gifts with poison. And that is done. Right. So again, uh, we'll come to the tale of Oedipus in a minute. Uh, this is, of course, a modern. performance so i don't want you to think that this is exactly how it was in ancient greece but what they have done is they've taken the concept of the chorus and of course they can't have 24 actors on the stage i think that would be very difficult to organize especially in a closed proscenium stage so they've got around four actors on the stage who are doing the same thing they're constantly there they themselves are not doing anything mind you you see that that's med that's the main character she's arguing with her husband she's having a fight but these guys they're constantly at the backdrop they're singing they're sort of you know helping her along they're watching it's almost as though they're a part of the audience itself so while sometimes they have their own things to say their own observations to make on other times it's almost as though they are the stand in for the audience on the stage so this is of course a modern adaptation but i think what it does help you to understand is that how they could have used this 24 member chorus very innovatively on the greek stage now why am i talking about this so much because what i want you to remember and this will come back in our conversation later what i want you to remember is that the um uh, uh, sorry please move so uh, what i want you to remember is that the greek stage could have i mean at that point of time uh, the chorus played the role of the audience almost um, guys one minute please we have a brief interruption
I'm very sorry, my cat appeared from somewhere and wanted to be let out. Um, very sorry about that interruption. <laughs> so anyway, I don't think my cat appreciates uh, Oedipus Rex very much. So that's the, those, these are the two aspects of Greek theater I want you to remember. That first and foremost, I want you to remember that Greek theater is a public affair that involves not just people, but entire communities. And that secondly, the chorus in particular almost takes on the role of the public because they become the audience on the stage. They have this unique position where they interact with the characters. They also interact with the audience, but they don't actually directly do anything on the stage itself. So this is something you should remember, and I hope you will later look this up because it's a fascinating aspect of Greek theater that modern theater does not really use beyond a certain point, though many people do experiment with it. From here onwards, what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about the story of Oedipus. And this is solely for people who are not familiar with the story. Um, it is, of course, a tragedy, and as um, again, if you ever have the opportunity to read poetics, or if those of you who may have already read the poetics in the course of studying your tragedies, you know that the end of a tragedy is catharsis, looking for the release of pity and fear that builds up in the audience uh, as the events of a particular play unfolds. In the case of Oedipus, the story of Oedipus Rex or Oedipus Tyrannos, the story is rather unfortunate. Um, like most other tragedies, Oedipus escapes his home in Corinth to avoid, and it's, I've also written this down so that you can see this. So you see, he's a young man who escapes his home in Corinth to avoid a prophecy. There's a prophecy that he'll kill his parents. So he comes to a place called Thebes, where he sort of, the, the city is being plagued by this particular creature who is not letting anybody inside, who is striking people sick. He wants everybody to solve a puzzle and everybody is failing to solve the puzzle. So Oedipus goes and solves the puzzle and so he saves the city. So the city says, you can become our new king because our old king is dead. And their queen, who was a widow, then becomes his wife. And so Oedipus lives fairly happily until a plague strikes Oedipus. And this, again, when we say plague, here, the word plague does not necessarily refer to the black plague, the typical illness. By plague, we do mean some sort of a illness, some sort of a, well, an epidemic, if not a pandemic, right? So a plague strikes thieves and the oracle, the priest of God Apollo, uh, Apollo who is, of course, the god of the, he's the sun god. He's also one of the patrons of the arts. So the priest tells them that, look, the killer of the previous king, has not been punished. There has been no justice for the previous king until and unless you found, find out who killed him and you give him the proper punishment, you are never going to be free. So then they get hold of this other old prophet called Tidetius. He's blind. And initially, he refuses to answer any questions. Eventually, when Oedipus forces him, he says that, Oedipus, you are responsible for the plague. Of course, Oedipus does not take this very lightly. But as the play progresses, and of course, I'm not going to tell you all the twists and turns of the play. But as it turns out, Oedipus finds out that the prophet was right. It is he who killed Laius, the old king. And not only that, this guy was actually his biological father. And that he is married to his biological mother, Yocasta. So this is something that Oedipus had no idea about. He ran away from a prophecy thinking, okay, I will not kill my father. But turns out the man he killed on the road, a man he did not know, was his biological father. His father had sent off the child in his childhood to be killed because of that same prophecy. But the man who was given the responsibility of killing that small baby could not do it. And so Oedipus grew up in another household, in his adoptive household, not knowing who his parents were. And even as he tried to protect his parents, he ended up killing one of them and being married to another one of them. So he is guilty of a number of crimes. He's guilty of fratricide because he kills his own father. He's guilty of regicide because he kills the king. And he's guilty of incest because he has married his own mother. So after knowing this, Yocasta kills herself and take the horror. 
uh, he sort of strikes himself in the eye in this very dramatic scene, goes blind. He and his children are exiled from Thebes. They have to leave. And it's with this departure that Thebes finally becomes free of the epidemic. So that's the story of Oedipus in a nutshell. There's an epidemic. Oedipus finds out that he's responsible. And because he's responsible, he has to be eventually thrown out of Thebes. Right. So that's the introductory story that about Oedipus that I wanted you to know. And again, for those of you who are already familiar with this story, this is a repetition. But that brings us to our conversation today. Now, when we normally read Oedipus' story in class, we and I've taught this text quite a few times before. I really enjoy teaching it. I've, I, we, I, I've in the past mostly taught this as a journey of Oedipus from ignorance to recognition because, right, he doesn't know. He doesn't know that he has committed a few crimes. And that remains the primary point of interest in the classroom as well. Because I find, again, students keep asking me, so is Oedipus responsible? If he did not know that Yocasta was his mother, then can we hold him guilty? Apollo clearly does. Fate clearly does. But is Oedipus guilty? Or is he a victim of destiny? These sort of questions come up in class. And you know we argue, I tend to argue, that we don't need to see it in black and white terms. It's not a false binary, right? It's about the play is about the fact that human beings can be blind to larger things at work, that we don't necessarily know what's going on in the wide world. And it's also a play about human greatness and inner strength. Because Oedipus, once he decides that he will find out the truth, he does go and face the truth. And that takes courage. So it's a play about both things. It's about fate and how cruel it can be. But it can also be about how strong human beings can be. right? When we teach this, and I teach this, I also talk about some aspects of Greek politics. Like we talk about the oikos and the polis. And they're inter I'll explain what this is to you. The word oikos in, Greece, in, in Greek means the household. And the polis means the city. So we talk about the relationship with the household and the city uh, and the connection between the two. Uh, we, we have to, we, uh, in class, we have conversations like, that the house of Oedipus has to be ruined, right? It's not Oedipus who alone is exiled. It's his children who are also paying the price for something they absolutely are not responsible for. But because they are his children, they too must pay the price. The house of Oedipus itself has to be ruined in order to save Thebes because the city has to be safe. And so we point out the fact that, you know, why is this? Because Oedipus is, look at the title of the place, Oedipus Rex or Oedipus Tyrannos. Rex or Tyrannos, both words mean king. So he is not simply an ordinary man. He is also Oedipus the king. He is the ruler of the city. And so this is a conversation that sort of comes up in my class always. And we tend to end up debating the place of the king or the place of the king in the police. What the Greeks thought of, the, again, police here means the city and not the police. Uh, what the Greeks thought of the police and what we might think of our own states. What is the role of the king in our times? Of course, we don't have kings, we have governments. But that conversation also, we have very lively conversations in class about this. But, you know, when I am talking to you today, I'm actually aware of this one element that I have, I admit to you that I have never talked about a lot in my class. And that is the fact that I've never really talked about the epidemic of Oedipus Rex. I think that's because before this, we didn't really have to think about epidemics in those senses, right? Sometimes you had a swine flu epidemic, but then it went away. Every year you have dengue and malaria, but that happens. Uh, none of us had really seen a pandemic of this scale. And so therefore, when I taught Oedipus in class, neither I nor my students were really interesting in that, interested in that aspect of the plague. But today, when I'm talking to you, it's the pandemic clearly speaking through me, but it's that's forced me to confront with some aspects of Oedipus Rex, and that is the question of the plague. How do we deal with the plague? This is a story that begins with the plague and ends with the plague. And it was a doctor who recently wrote, let me read this out for, from him. Um, he wrote recently that 
our current scenario and the isolation it requires re contains haunting echoes of Oedipus's thieves when it was ravaged by a plague. Why does it, he means by current isolation, of course, all of you have lived through the lockdown. And even now, I, I don't know what's going on in your home uh, city or in your home uh, village, wherever you are located right now. I don't know what the situation is like. But I know that here in Calcutta, I'm still going to have to be very careful interacting with people because not only has COVID not gone away, um, it's affecting people in my immediate circle, three colleagues who are uh, one colleague's uh, little son is also sick. Um, my father's colleague's dad passed away yesterday. So this is what we are dealing with, right? I, I'm sure you have all heard these stories. Um, so if I may quote the doctor again, in the opening scene of the classic Greek tragedy, Oedipus Rex, the contagion's effects are evident as the streets lie empty. Children are ripped from their parents and citizens from their police. A priest laments, and if you turn your... Um, uh, if you turn your eyes to the screen, this is an open. This is the opening scene of Oedipus Rex, and this is what the chorus sings out: "A blight is on the fruitful plants of the earth. A blight is on the cattle in the fields. A blight is on our women that no children are born to them. A god that carries fire. A deadly pestilence is on our town. Strikes us and spares not. And the house of Cadmus is emptied of its people, while Black Death grows rich in groaning and in lamentation. People keep dying. Not only things, as it turns out, it's just not just people who are dying. They also have crops dying. So things are generally dire. But think about this focus, this this lamentation. This is not also our story. Have we not watched empty streets? Have we not watched shut shops? Have we not watched with horror as the pandemic hits closer home? I've had family members gone to the hospital. Thankfully, they've come back. Um, but have we not heard of crematoriums being too full in cities like Delhi and Bombay? Have we not heard of hospitals piling up bodies? Have we not heard of mass graves in Iran and in America? Have we not heard of families unable to meet their loved ones for the last time? We have. Elsewhere in the world, and as we look at the world now, countries, and very disparate countries, countries as different as the US and the Iran, they are at war with each other. But they are united by COVID-19 because both countries have had to dig mass graves, unmarked graves, so not even a proper farewell. And such a story, when we think about this, it does demand a closer look, right? And so let's see where Oedipus Rex takes us in this time. Now, uh, if you're familiar with Greek literature, you'll know that plagues, epidemics are actually not uncommon in Greek literature. The Iliad, for instance, which is a great uh, epic, Greek epic composed by Homer, it is older, it is way older than Oedipus Rex. It begins with also an epidemic that keeps killing all the soldiers in the Greek camp. And it's learned that the god Apollo is very angry. And so therefore, he's punishing them for this. The Oxford classicist, uh, Mary Beard, she's a great scholar of the classics, she said, the plague in the Iliad was the first pandemic in Western literature. And she told, she sort of urged in this piece that she wrote, Western literature began with infection. I think that's a very interesting way of looking at it because it makes a very close and intimate connection between human health, human suffering, disease and literature. Now, this is something we don't normally think about in ordinary circumstances. But the pandemic is in many ways forcing us to do this. If we move away from literature to Greek history, uh, we look at a text like Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War. I'm not asking you to read it. It's a huge eight-volume book. But he is also a contemporary of Sophocles, the playwright. And he provides the account of a real plague. In Athens, in 430 BC, they had this plague, which had probably come from Ethiopia. And present day doctors have been unable to figure out what that illness was. They have these theories. It was typhoid. It was this. It was that. But the symptoms included sickness, vomiting, uh, you know, hoarseness of the throat, coughing. People's bodies became hot, hot to touch. So they clearly ran a temperature. Painful boils broke out on the screen. Uh, on the skin, people had a raging thirst, so they were always thirsty. And as the disease took hold again, the people who started to get sick first were the doctors. 
Poor people especially suffered hugely during that epidemic in uh, Athens. Complete social order broke down. People started, you know, people stopped even praying because they were so sick. And the historian himself, Thukidides, the man whom I named here, he himself had contracted that illness. But he, of course, recovered. But, you know, this, uh, this epidemic had a massive impact on Athens because it killed some of their youngest men, some of their strongest men, which means that they were in the middle of a war. And suddenly their best soldiers are dying out of this epidemic. What happens? They lose the war. Secondly, they also lose their biggest leader. His name was Pericles. Uh, of course, Athens didn't have a prime minister. But had they had a prime minister, Pericles would have been that guy. So, you know, we've seen that President Donald Trump fell sick. Um, you, we, we've seen that Boris Johnson fell sick. We've seen Jair, Jair Bolsonaro fell sick. They have, of course, all recovered. But Pericles was not so lucky. He died. And now imagine your leader dying in the middle of an epidemic. The entire city state was in complete ravages, right? And Sophocles, and as well as his audiences, they would have known this epidemic very intimately. And what is very curious is that the story of Oedipus, like all other stories in uh, Greek epic cycles, are not original stories. They are all folk narratives that are passed on from one writer to another orally and then in a written form, right? But Sophocles is the only person who sort of takes the story of Oedipus and makes this a story of plague. Before him, when Homer tells the same story, the story of the plague is not there. And that's what makes us think that Clearly, Oedipus Rex was performed after the Athenian plague. And we don't know if Sophocles himself had fallen ill. But we know that his audience would have recognized this story. So even though we who are all very far removed, we don't know what happened in Athens after a certain point. The Athenian audience would have known that exactly what Sophocles is talking about. And that added to the story's topicality, I think. Of course, the story, the play, didn't win the first prize that year. They had prizes in the festival. Oedipus came second. He didn't come first. But the effectiveness and the popularity of the play is perhaps most evident in the fact that we are still sitting here 2,000 years later and talking about the play that came second and not the play that came first. So therefore, we don't even know which play came first. So how do we read a play like this? How do we, which was composed after an epidemic that left thousands of people in Greece dead, an uh, epidemic that Sophocles himself and his audience members, that they probably survived this. And some of them may have even had that illness. And so one important aspect of how they saw the play, it must have been about the figure of the king, about the leader. And you know, I'm not the only person thinking this, uh, because uh, take uh, oh, this is this is the image of this is an artist representation of the plague. You can see that you know people are lying on the streets dead. So that's how Thucydides describes it: that people were literally falling off dead in the streets. And I think we have seen examples of this in various parts of the world during this epidemic as well. But let's come a little bit ahead. Now, you can see, and that's where we come to the contemporary discussion, right? Uh, these are all opinion pieces from, the, from American newspapers, right? And uh, of course, I'm not suggesting that you only read headlines, but see the three headlines. President Tum Brum versus Oedipus Rex. Leaders reveal themselves in times of plague. An ancient Greek tragedy holds a mirror to Trump's coronavirus leadership. When plagues followed bad leadership, Greek tragedy of Oedipus Tyrannus is a lesson for Trump on COVID-19. So I, there's something curious going on here, right? That uh, these pieces, all three pieces, are a critique of the US president. US, as we know, is the country hardest hit by the pandemic, even worse than us. And that is saying something. Uh, they have close to 300,000 people dead by now. Uh, so all these three pieces, they are criticisms of President Trump and his leadership during the plague, while in the light of Oedipus Rex. 
And we, of course, I've, because I've told you the story as readers of the play, we know that it is Oedipus who is responsible for the suffering of the people in the play, right? So therefore, these three pieces are not simply saying that President Trump must learn. They're also saying that he is responsible for the suffering of his, of his people. So that's a very interesting point they're making. And why does such a comparison come, right? We have to ask. This is an ancient Greek place from two th play from 2,000 years ago. So how come this comparison is even possible in the year 2020? And let me quote from Mika Altola, who, is, who wrote this essay on the politics of pandemic scares in 2020. He says, and I want you to listen to this, diseases interact with power in that they can be read as signs of illegitimating weakness or as demonstrations of unimaginable strength. The production of health has been often framed as a powerful demonstration of the legitimacy of political rule and the absence of health suggests the existence of fundamental injustice and transgressions, not only at the physical level, but in the way political power is upheld. So diseases are often linked directly to the health of the country itself, the health of the government itself. This, in fact, if you look at ancient narratives, um, I uh, apologize if I, I didn't think when I drew examples from the Mahabharata and the Ramayana, some of you may not be familiar with the whole stories, but I'll, I'll explain them to you. In the Mahabharata, for instance, uh, you have a lot of miraculous healing, strange cures, you know, gods coming in to intervene. Um, there are always these miraculous healings and these curses. In the Mahabharata, you have a character called Dhritarashtra. He is the king of Hastinapura, but he is blind. And his blindness is not simply a sign of his physical blindness. It also is a sign of his larger uh, inability inability to see the problems of his own kingdom and the problems with his own sons so he is a disqualified le leader meanwhile there is another scene in the ramayana and again i understand if you're not familiar with it uh, there is a character called hanuman who is uh, who has to bring this important cure this one particular um, uh, plant that will cure rama's brother lakshman he is unable to find that, so he brings an entire mountain with him. Now, this is not actually a sign of his stupidity. No, it is in fact a sign of his strength and his loyalty. So in the story of Oedipus itself, Oedipus, how does he come to power? I told you, right? He comes to power uh, by, he comes to power by solving a puzzle. Uh, that the Sphinx had posed, and so therefore he saves Thebes, right? So therefore, Oedipus himself comes to power by, and why is he so well loved? Why is he so arrogant about himself? Because he restores health in Thebes. He brings a new legitimate rule by making everybody in Thebes healthy again. And so therefore, that is what gives him legitimacy, not blood. He doesn't know he's Laius's son, right? So it's not as though his blood light is what makes him king. What makes him king is that he is able to get rid of the Sphinx and he's able to cure everybody in Thebes. And that is precisely what makes him king. It follows then that the plague at the beginning of Oedipus Rex, it threatens this very legitimacy of his rule, right? Because he was king, because he had healed everybody. Now, when he everybody is sick again with this epidemic, Oedipus' whole reign is at threat. And I think Oedipus recognizes that. That is precisely why he sends, sends asking for you know, help from Apollo, from uh, Tiresias. He takes pride in his intelligence and he knows what's at stake. He knows that it's not simply the lives of people that's at stake, though that's important too. It, the, all, his legitimacy as a king itself is at stake. His conflict, you know, he ends up arguing with the prophet. And that's not simply a product of his arrogance and blindness. Um, earlier in class, I used to say that he, it's because he's arrogant. But it's not just that. He knows that if Tiresias is right, if he really is responsible for the plague, then his political career is over. His rule, his reign, his legitimacy is over. 
because you see the king is responsible for the health of the state both physical and spiritual it makes or breaks political careers as it did with Oedipus and now we know as it has done with President Trump though he keeps claiming that he has won the election but I think you can see why people were drawing these comparisons eventually the American vote did end up becoming a referendum on President Trump and people said you're not good enough anymore because you couldn't save us our lives you couldn't make us healthy enough however I think it would be very unfair if we sort of limited our discussion of Oedipus Rex to just the king because you know it's the people who voted Trump out uh, Dr. Antiel whom I quoted earlier he said the plague of Thebes also speaks to the communal nature by communal I mean the community nature of suffering despite the modern fixation of individual medicine the current pandemic reveals radical individualism as a facade we are social animals and I think you recognize this right because how often have we been told that dealing with the pan pandemic is our collective responsibility right it's not just me it's all of us because we've been asked to wear masks when they say that, you know, wear a mask. It's not just about protecting me. It's also protecting me from you. We are protecting others from ourselves. The pandemic has weaponized our bodies. And each and every one of us has the potential to cause immense harm to others. I do, I, when I go out without a mask, I may not want to hurt anybody. But I might end up hurting somebody right and that brings us to another aspect of Oedipus Rex uh, this too is something that we neglected a lot in our classes that's why I spent five minutes at the beginning telling you about the chorus you see when we talk about the chorus in class students don't really get excited about it because it's just lines of poems then there's no singing and dancing so they say why do we need to read this but you know, uh, removed from the vibrant culture, it doesn't feel, they feel very boring to the students. But uh, again, the pandemic is forcing me to think this, that do the songs of the chorus, as I told you at the beginning, do they not represent the voice of the people? Do they not represent the voice of the citizens? And what do we make of this voice? And just look at this conversation, right? The chorus comes and they tell Oedipus, this is, this is, this is a, uh, one of the early dialogues. They say, look around you, see with your own eyes. They want Oedipus to witness, to see their suffering. Thebes is dying, they tell him. So they come to their king and they tell him, please look at how much we are suffering. And what do they say? Look at these lines, especially come to the end of this. They come and tell him, listen, they call you savior now for your actions years ago, but rise up again. Look at the last lines. This is what I want you to read out. Rule our land. You know you have the power, but rule a land of the living, not a wasteland. Ship and towered city are nothing. Stripped of men alive within it, living all as one. Of course, they are being very reverential. They are not threatening him. They are saying that, please save us. But there is an element of or else, you know, because what do they say? They say that rule a land of the living, not a wasteland. You need people alive in order to rule them, in order to be king. They say, he's, they say look, at, look at this here. They say that raise up our city, act, defend yourself. But why must he defend himself? What will he defend himself against? Is there a war? This is a kind of a war. If he cannot restore health to Thebes, as he once did in the past, then what other claim does he have on them? A leader who is not respected by his subjects is not a leader, for he has no political power over them, right? If you do not respect your leader, then he no longer has legitimacy. And nowhere is this made clearer. The Although, you know, Ethem, I mean, Thebes itself is not democratic, but Athens where Sophocles wrote this play, was a democratic city-state. And you can see that hint of democracy playing out here as well. The ruler is dependent on the support of the people, not bloodline, not legacy, not anything, not whose son he is. If he cannot heal Thebes, he will probably not survive as a ruler. And the Koryk songs, furthermore, uh, I will not read this whole thing out, but you know, maybe this one's just, just as an example that 
uh, because you know when we read this out again this should be sung and danced with we don't have that because when it read out it sort of loses the potency but this is the voice of the citizens who are experiencing the pandemic well their plague deaths so many deaths numberless deaths on deaths no end thieves is dying look her children stripped of pity generations strewn on the ground unburied unwept the dead spreading death young wives and gray haired mothers with them cling to the older trailing in from all over city everybody is dying the city of death one long cortege and the suffering rises wails for mercy rise and the wild hymn for the healer the healer is the god blazes out so they keep praying to the gods their gods to save them and i think we we recognize this right because we have seen the death toll rise even in india more than um a lakh people have died uh in my state west bengal itself almost 10000 people have died and this has included people i have known people who were old as well as people who were my age so this death toll is something that we have seen this right people are more than numbers they are somebody's wife someone's beloved someone's child and you know in the pandemic people have been stripped bare of dignity because we have seen times where and we are seeing this in delhi right now the capital of this country which is facing this that again the health services are sort of overwhelmed there are no beds in hospitals people are constantly trying to do their best to find some cure but you know body bags piled up crematoriums open 24 hours mass graves the chorus might be talking about us here right and truth to this sentiment as the play progresses and the question of oedipus's identity that he is the lyas's son that becomes greater and greater the chorus also speaks about the anxiety of citizens right so though they speak in that voice and once at the end of the play and this is this is one of the last scenes of the chorus it is the concluding lines of the play the anxiety and terror of death translates into further horror because you know the chorus looks on as edipus suffers edipus finds out then he hurts himself his wife dies uh, all of this happens and in this final song it's not merely a moralistic piece of advice they're giving no it's a statement of people who have survived they have survived the epidemic right what are they saying look on edipus he solved the famous riddle with his brilliance he rose to power a man beyond all power who could behold his greatness without envy and now what a black sea of terror has overwhelmed him now as we keep our watch and wait the final day count no man happy till he dies free of pain at last this is not these lines count no man happy till he dies free of pain at last this is not simply a cynical dismissal of life no these are the survivors of the theban plague who are talking to the audience who are the survivors of the athenian plague the original audience of the play and they are telling us that the horror of an epidemic the horror of a plague like this is something that we are left with the scars remain with us even if the disease goes away because i think none of us will ever forget this period uh, in our history even if our economy recovers even if most of us get that vaccine whenever that happens the people who whom we have lost will not come back the people who will live with the effects of the disease will continue to live with it and we will all live with this memory which is why the voice of the chorus also becomes a voice that's almost our voice right i think i've i've gone on long enough i'll i'll conclude with the same doctor whom i've been quoting because his piece moved me so much he he wrote that as a genre tragedy aims to teach citizens how to bear and respond to suffering because that is the aim of tragedy how do we deal with pain how do we deal with suffering that's the key of tragedy how and when it is proper to feel pity and fear the original athenian audience watching the play would have recognized that if this could happen to edipus whom all men call the great the same could happen to them tragedy instructs us to accept the limits of our existence the corona virus is a reminder of our vulnerability and our finitude 
and that's true isn't it i personally have lost two acquaintance one friend and one acquaintance both of whom were my age and that sort of made it very clear to me that we are not it could happen to any one of us and death too could take us we are small we are finite in the face of something like this when the pandemic comes to an end whenever that is i don't even know what will happen to our world if we will be speaking as survivors the same way that the chorus is speaking here but if tragedy is a sure as the good doctor tells us it teaches how us to how to bear and respond to suffering then perhaps the tragedy of oedipus rex can also prove cathartic in its own ways in in these pandemic times it can perhaps offer us some relief for those of us at least who turn to it and with that i think i'll come to an end of my discussion i've gone on long enough i'm very grateful to you again for hearing me out and i would love to answer your questions if you have them uh thank you swati for this wonderful uh, lecture and we are very happy to have you as the uh, you know inaugural speaker of our pg uh, studies where uh, lecture series so uh, thanks for bringing a uh, lot of contemporary political issues and trying to connect uh, uh, edipus rex with the present situation and the relationship between the uh, um, you know the state of health and uh, disease or uh, about the uh, uh, or the people who are uh, caught up in uh, yeah, I mean, it's a pandemic <clears throat> so uh, i will open the floor for a uh, question answer so maybe we can take a uh, very few questions uh, uh, maybe two or three questions so keep it very short if you have any question to ask uh, swati so the question uh, the floor is open now for question answer and discussion like is there any question any questions in which case uh... Yeah, so I uh, so I I have a comment because you know because uh, uh, it has never uh, occurred to me while uh, you know as you know that I do theater and I have done Greek theater also uh, uh, you know it has never occurred to me uh, because we have never done read Oedipus Rex we have never researched on Oedipus Rex. particularly uh, through the lens of uh, cultural studies and historical studies is that perhaps what you have mentioned in the talk that uh, this play was perhaps uh, performed after some kind of plague or epidemic uh, struck the uh, you know ethen uh, ethenian uh, society and you know that's why because uh, as you mentioned you know in homer's reference to oedipus rex which is all to do about incest and about uh, illegitimacy of uh, uh, the position of the king and uh, sophocles's oedipus rex is very uh, di uh, different because uh, as you mentioned that you know sophocles is the entire play revolves around disease about uh, revolves around a plague yes and in fact if uh, you take a look at um, bernard knox has written about this the date of oedipus rex's exact performance is disputed now knox takes on this same point and we can't conclusively prove anything of course but knox takes on this point to argue decisively and i find it a very good persuasive argument that um, the only reason why sophocles is so very concerned i mean he didn't need the story of oedipus is already sad right why add an epidemic to it there are already other elements of it right there is a blight there is women not having children there is the whole story of all these you know crops not uh, uh, there's a pestilence so why do you need to add the epidemic and my only conclusion as with bernard knox is that he adds the epidemic precisely because he had seen that epidemic and so had his audience yeah so i i think this is a very uh, exciting uh, insight uh, and uh, yeah so so i find it very interesting yes 
Oh, sorry. Um, I have a sort of a comment, but also something, uh, some thoughts um, regarding, uh, you know, what Dr. Moitra has shared, and it's a wonderful talk. Um, Dr. Moitra, thank you for that. But I wanted to just draw some parallels with our context. As mentioned earlier, um, you know, in our folklore, in our um, oral traditions, uh, we have many of these stories of death. Uh, death by unexplained uh, circumstances, mostly. Um, but, but it's this death, as well as these um, challenges that a person goes through, is also a sort of a, one can say it's like the passage, ritual passage. Of yes, the, yes. The feast of marriage, as they call it. So, you know, I was just wondering in terms of um, uh, what you have shared, and that seems to be the predominant theme. Um, and, and in a way, um, that some of the things that you have also said, that we, there seems to be a tendency for us humans to forget or, you know, forget our mortality, right? I mean, it's just a thought that came to me. Yeah. No, no, absolutely, I agree with you. Uh, I While I'm not the most versed in the uh, the the absolute the the richness of the oral cultures of Nagaland and there are so many. I've read a little bit of this element in Eastern Kire's When the River Sleeps, um, where she also draws upon folklore to address the question of, you know, coming of age, of going through certain things and encountering, among other things, death. And I think this is a this aspect of Naga folklore that you're talking about that not only connects it to folklore in various parts of this country where you will see similar themes of death, of uh, life and what it means to journey through that, that also connects folklore to the ancient epics where similar themes play out right back to the epic of Gilgamesh where the story is Gilgamesh going to look for his friend Enkidu after death and then he learns at the end of the play that the gods tell him that the life you seek you will not find when the gods created mankind death they gave to mankind and life they kept for themselves so that human life is a journey through death that it is a journey through fragility that I think oral cultures have oral traditions. Epic traditions are also oral traditions. I think oral traditions have always understood this in a way that our modern traditions with modern medicine often forgets because of you know the pretense that we are immortal right we like to i'll have something i'll have a medicine i'll be fine but oral cultures have always understood this very intimately and that aspect of naga culture that you spoke of that is at once very particular but also in many ways universal to other ancient cultures as well and that's why i really liked your observation thank you so much for it thank you dr maitra right Um, so, any other question, comment? Uh, uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for the uh, like very insightful talk which you gave. Um, I just wanted to relate uh, the scene of Adipus Rex with China itself, uh, if it will make sense. Uh, because, uh, especially with, uh, you know, uh, China is China for me was almost like the uh, this Oedipus Rex who was popular, who solved a puzzle and then who was loved by everyone. Um, because China before the pandemic was very popular, uh, especially it, it gave like a great boost to economy for various countries. It was, uh, uh, especially in India also, various Chinese products were entertained like in a good way, right? But after the pandemic happened, uh, uh, you know, uh, the whole world kind of uh, turned away from China. They started blaming China. And even in India, we see a lot of Chinese apps being banned. You know, uh, the trade relations are affected. So uh, in this way, I kind of related uh, this Oedipus Rex with China as well. Like Oedipus Rex himself is China and the world is like the people 
uh, you know the subject of Oedipus Rex. I think that's an absolutely great reading. And in fact, uh, if you add this a little bit further, think of countries like Vietnam, South Korea, Japan, New Zealand. All these countries have actually very successfully dealt with the pandemic. New Zealand, I think, has had zero day. Vietnam, which is a country with as much population as my state of West Bengal, which is a very densely populated state. Uh, Vietnam has had zero deaths, zero. Right. And that has also sort of put the lens on what is good governance. Now, China, for instance, is a very rich country. And sure, we admire the fact that they are so rich, they're so powerful. but. China did fail to save lives of their citizens, right? And similarly, the USA, the UK, and even us, we have failed to save the lives of our citizens, while a country as tiny as Vietnam managed to not lose even not one life. So this is, you're absolutely right, it's sort of asking, forcing us to ask these questions that what is the best, what, what makes countries strong? Is it simply economic strength? Is it simply wealth? Is it simply military? Or is it also taking care of the health of the citizens? Right? Um, uh, so yes, I absolutely agree with your reading. And thank you so much for voicing it here. Um, I think uh, we're probably done okay. with questions, Gaurav. Yes, maybe. Yes. Yeah. So if you have any question, you can always uh, write to us and we can always forward to Swati if you want to know more, if you, if you want to uh, get some extra readings on Oedipus Rex. I am sure Absolutely. Swati will be very uh, helpful and uh, as a you know, resource person. So, okay, so I thank uh, uh, Swati uh, again and uh, everyone who uh, has joined today for our first uh, uh, lecture of the PG Studies uh, lecture series. So uh, we will be having another talk next uh, next week uh, because as you know that this is the um, uh, Native American Heritage Month. And we will have uh, Wafa Hamid from uh, uh, Delhi University, who will be, whom Swati and I and some of us uh, know. So she will be talking about uh, the Native American uh, and Black American history. So, uh, so thank, uh, thank you all of you again, and thank to Swati for this wonderful talk. Thank you, everybody. I'm very happy to be here, and you're very lucky that Wafa is going to speak next week. You must tune in because she's a wonderful speaker. Thanks.